so thank you. I missed half of that. So um, you're going to have to repeat it again next year. Next year. Uh, I, I apologize. You've heard this before. The only thing that is different is a few of the slides, but the fonts are going to be exactly the same. Somebody complained about the fonts last time. <laughs> I just like Comic Sans. I'm sorry. Um, so rather than uh, talk about <laughs> antimatter, I'll talk about the return of the antimatter. And you've seen this kind of movie before. Uh, I'm afraid uh, it's going to be the same thing. In fact, antimatter um, has a, the same kind of problem. In the beginning, there was nothing. And then it all happened, it was over, and that was it. Uh, that was the end of antimatter. And I'm going to talk about what happened in this very short instance right after the Big Bang. So to understand what antimatter is, I'm sorry, this is the only equation. E is equal to mc squared. I have to say that. Uh, and basically, all this says is that energy and matter or antimatter are just the same thing, two different forms of the same thing. And if you look at what physics in the last century has figured out, is basically conservation laws and quantum electrodynamics, which say nothing more than that every time you have this process happening, pairs of particles and antiparticles appear at the same time. You can't have a particle without an antiparticle appearing. And in other words, right after the Big Bang, you have to have 50% matter and 50% antimatter. There's no way around that. And in fact, you can see this happening all the time. Every time we do these experiments, you can see that there are always, let me see if I can, yeah, you can see pairs of particles and antiparticles. Pairs, particle, antiparticle, pair, 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 and so on. So every time you transform energy into stuff, you're going to get a particle and antiparticle at the same time. But if you look out in the universe now, so I've got this great telescope that can differentiate between matter <coughs> and antimatter. So on the left-hand side, this is a telescope that only sees matter. And you can see all these beautiful galaxies. There's billions of them. And on the right-hand side, the same telescope or the special telescope will see antimatter. There's nothing there. It's all disappeared. So basically, you've lost half of the universe right there. Rather than having what we thought was a symmetric universe with the same amounts of matter as antimatter, what really happened is right after the Big Bang, matter and antimatter annihilated each other, and there's a slight excess of matter. And in fact, it looks like we have an anti-symmetric universe. So if all this has happened, what we are are just the leftovers from this initial cataclysm. So it's a huge challenge to try to understand this asymmetry and, by the way, also understand what antimatter is. And a lot of time has been spent, again, in the 20th century, trying to understand what matter is. So starting with macroscopic stuff like crystals, and DNA, molecules, going down to atoms, atomic nuclei, then the substructure of the nuclei, the protons and the neutrons, inside which are quarks, leptons, and this is as far as we know what's going on right now. What we believe, what we think, is that matter and antimatter are exactly the same. There's no difference between the two. The only difference is that they have an opposite charge. And you can think of antimatter as money, in a way. Maybe that's an analogy to take home. Um, money can be something you have in your bank account or something you don't have in your bank account. In one case, it's positive. In the other case, it's negative. But in both cases, it's the same thing. It's, it's some abstract quantity, which is either in your pocket or in the bank's pocket. And the real question is, is there any difference between matter and antimatter that we can possibly use to try to find out why the antimatter has disappeared and why the universe isn't just empty right now? So OK, you're familiar with this picture, I think. Um, I just want to point out the two places where CERN is looking at antimatter. This is the LHCb experiment. And this is where the real action is happening. And what we basically do there is use a system made of atoms, made completely of antimatter, which have the great benefit that you can study them very, very precisely. If you measure the light emitted by antihydrogen atoms, when you can do this very precisely, you have an extremely sensitive test of the properties of antimatter and of matter. And this picture here just shows the ratio of precision that you can reach with antihydrogen atoms. You can think of taking the Mont Blanc, cutting it off at the base, putting it on a balance, weighing it, and then putting a paper clip on top and weighing it again. This precision of one part in 10 to the 18 is the kind of precision you think we think we can reach with antihydrogen atoms if we can make it. And not only make it, but also trap it, and then cool it down to very, very low temperatures, a millionth of a degree above absolute zero, and then precisely, and, and very, very precisely, measure the light emitted by antihydrogen. So making antihydrogen from the first moment we tried to make it took about five to eight years. 
Trapping antihydrogen, and this is where this is a difference to the previous talk, so those who were not paying attention up to now can start looking. We started five years ago trying to trap antihydrogen. Once we've trapped antihydrogen, we think we can cool it, but it'll take a long time, five to eight years, and then maybe in about ten years' time, we might be able to actually compare hydrogen with antihydrogen. So this thing here we did in 2002, and at that point, you can take two alternative paths. You can either st stick with your guns and try to continue along this path here until you're old and retired, or you can try something new. And knowing that the something new might be a detour, but a detour is sometimes shorter and a little bit more scenic. So some of us stuck with our guns, and they tried to trap antihydrogen. So of course you need a can for antihydrogen. Now the can of antihydrogen, because antihydrogen, as soon as it touches matter, is going to annihilate, is a can that doesn't consist of anything except magnetic fields. And with that, you can trap antihydrogen the way I can trap an elephant. It's very simple to trap an elephant. You just stick out a peanut, you let the elephant grab the peanut, and you don't let go. There, you've trapped the elephant. Now, this works very well if the elephant is not moving all too fast. Now, in this case, these atoms have to be pretty cold. They have to have a temperature of less than one degree <coughs> above absolute zero, actually less than half of a degree above absolute zero. But then you can hang on with this magnetic field to the anti-electron, and the anti-electron hangs on to the elephant for you, the anti-proton. So just November this year, a month ago basically, the Alpha experiment announced that they had managed to trap 38 atoms. It took them something like a million atoms of anti-hydrogen that they had produced and several months of work, but so finally they managed to trap these 38 atoms which is great. It's a, it's a huge step forward. They're very proud of this. Uh, but, of course, the real question is, what are you going to do with it? Why is this important? Well, once you have lots of these, now 38 is not a lot, but you can it's a small step, or it's a big step, actually, towards lots, you can study these at your leisure. And at your leisure is very important because, in this case, time is precision. The longer you can watch these atoms inside your trap, the more precisely you can study them. If you want to get to a precision of one part in 10 to the 18, you're going to have to really work at it for months, looking at a small number of atoms. You need maybe a factor of 100 more than this, so it's not that far away. So this was the experiment that made the, ex the antihydrogen atoms that, that trapped them. It's a huge mess. Uh, I, I don't want to go through the details of this thing here, but this is where the atoms were trapped, right in that big can. Uh, that's a big magnet containing another magnet, and so on and so on. That was plan A. This is plan B. You can try to do something else. Rather than trying to trap antihydrogen, you can try to drop it. Right? When you drop something, it falls. As Galileo found <coughs> out here when he dropped, well, this is probably a lead ball and this is probably a ball of wood. They both fall at the same rate and hit the ground at the same time. Now the question is, what happens if you try this with antihydrogen? If you drop antihydrogen from here and hydrogen from here, do they fall at the same time? This is something that's never before been attempted. It only became feasible recently, a few years ago. And often, you tend to be surprised by what you discover when you look where other people haven't looked before. <coughs> so this experiment is actually a very simple one. Uh, it's going to avoid the problem of having to trap antihydrogen by not trying to trap them. You use the fact that they're moving, and you use them a little bit like cannonballs flying horizontally. So here's the experiment in all its glory. These are technical details. You just make a stream of antihydrogen atoms that you then shoot through some structure that allows you to see how they fall. And basically, it relies on borrowing and stealing ideas from many different fields to make the experiment feasible. It's a very good idea, if you're trying to do something new, to steal and borrow as much as possible. <laughs> now, there's only a small problem that some technical breakthroughs are still needed. We're working on those. And, of course, you can expect results soon. Soon in this field means somewhere around 2014. So we expect, if we can <coughs> have these miracles happen, to have a result in 2014, so Eve uh, can invite me again in, in a few years' time, to talk about the next step of antimatter, when we will have seen whether antimatter falls or not. Now, of course, this is all fundamental physics. It takes a long time, and it's very expensive. And so the real question is, what can you do with antimatter? And will it make me rich? And no, you cannot use it to fuel spaceships. Unfortunately, Star Trek is not going to work with antimatter. But there are some ideas, and some very concrete ideas, of how you can make money with antimatter. Some of these actually work. So let me start with the first one that has made some people very rich. 
It's positron emission tomography, which you know as PET scans, <laughs> and which rely on the fact that anti-electrons, positrons, can be incorporated in the body through form of radioisotopes. So you inject the radioisotope stuck onto some sugar, you inject that into the body, the body, the bloodstream, carries it around up to those cells which have a high metabolic rate. In there, the sugar gets used up, but the radioisotope st sticks around, decays at some point, produce produces an anti-electron, and this anti-electron annihilates immediately with an electron and produces two photons which you can reconstruct and detect. And from that, you can reconstruct what's happening inside the brain. For example, you can see which parts of the brain are involved in hearing <coughs> words, or in seeing words, or in speaking words, or in thinking about words. So you can think of antimatter as being a tool to study the brain, but of course it's also a tool to try to detect cancers, because cancer cells are also very furiously using up energy to divide and multiply and grow the tumor. So rather than just look at where the tumor is, you can try of treating the tumor. And in the past, people have treated tumor with surgery, of course that works very well, with chemotherapy, or with radiation therapy. And this plot here shows you what the problem with radiation therapy is. When you treat a body with radiation therapy or tumor with radiation therapy, you just send a lot of particles into the body. Now these particles are going to interact with the body, and if these particles are light photons, gamma rays, they have the highest probability of stopping pretty right after the skin, the first few centimeters, and the deeper you go into the body, the less photons there are, because the ones that have already stopped, they're not going to go any further. So as you go deeper in the body, there's less and less energy deposited, and if this is where the tumor is, and this is how much energy you have to deposit to kill the tumor, you can see that the cells in front of the tumor have gotten even more energy. So you've basically treated the tumor by drilling a hole through the patient. You've killed the tumor, but the patient isn't very healthy either. So the only way you can use gamma rays is by shooting from many different directions, by diluting this stuff here, this heavy damage, over a large volume, and having these rays cross in the, in the position of the tumor. But that's never going to be very good. So an alternative is to use protons instead which behave very differently. They hit the body, they slow down inside the body, lose a little bit of energy, and then in the last millimeter or so, they lose a lot of energy and they stop. End of story. So by using protons instead of gamma rays, you can actually deposit a lot of energy inside the tumor, large dosage in the tumor, and not damage the healthy tissue too much. Now if you replace protons with antiprotons, What's going to happen, at least from a physicist's point of view, is that they behave exactly the same way as protons. They slow down inside the tumor, they stop there, and then they can annihilate. And by annihilating, they produce extra radiation inside the tumor, and so you <coughs> kill even more cells here. And we did the experiment with hamster cells in a test tube in an aquarium, and in fact, this model is exactly correct. You kill four times more cells with antiprotons in this area here than with protons, but you do the same amount of damage here. So it's a very, very promising idea if what you want to do is kill hamster cells in a test tube. Now, of course, you really want to treat patients at some point, so there are a lot of experiments that still need to be done. These experiments are expensive and they take time, so we need to get some more sources of money. And a great place to find money is in the art market, at least if you know the right people. So, for example, if we had bought this picture here, uh, this painting, about 50 years ago, by Salvador Dali, we could have paid for several of these experiments easily several times over. But that's not really worth a lot of money. I mean, we get a few million, but okay. To get some more money, you actually have to go to another entertainment industry, which is Hollywood. This is a lot of money. The Angels and Demons movie brought in hundreds of millions of dollars. It's again based on antimatter in a trap, and this is what antimatter looks like if you could actually hold it. Or at least this is what Hollywood thinks that antimatter looks like. It's not quite the real thing. And again, this is a lot of money. It's more money than in art, but it's not where the real money is. You all know where the real money is. It's in banking, of course. Now, one thing you can do with antimatter is destroy banks, or you could, but banks are much better at it than we are. So we're not gonna try and destroy banks. In fact, what we're going to do is base a bank on something really uh, insubstantial. Not deposits, not gold, but actually isotopes. Radioisotopes, the rarest thing that there is. And with that, I've come to the end of this talk. Thank you for your attention.